G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David, and I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, where we help specialize in taking Australian investors from their start to their ambitions to scale up their property portfolio. The nature behind uh, building out these podcasts was the opportunity to chat to people that have been there, done that, uh, and I use the word best in breed. So a lot of the people that we bring on are experts in their field and I, I feel like we are absolutely privileged and honoured to have them join us because their intentions are pure. They want to share their knowledge, they want to help other investors grow and off the back of that, it's what I call a win-win. They get to pass and, um, and pay it forward with their knowledge and journey but our investor clients also get to pick their brains and maybe not have access to some of these great professionals and today's guest uh, is a name that uh, if you know anything about investing in property, it's a name that comes as synonymous with uh, property investment. Welcome to the show, Bushy Martin from Know How Property. How you doing? Yeah, awesome, Aaron. Uh, very humbled and privileged and excited to join you and talk all things property today. Mate, mate the feelings are mutual. And I don't say that lightly. Uh, you're, a, you're a, a person in both the broking sphere, but also the property sphere. Um, where people hold you in a really high esteem. I'm, I certainly don't say that to, um, to blow any smoke because you don't buy into that, but more so um, uh, a lot of the guests that we've had on is what I call sustained success. So you've had a, a career that's gone and stood the test of time. You've had clients that have sung your praises. Yep, you might have picked up a few accolades or awards on the, on the journey, but that was never the intention. It was how do I help more Australians and how do I help shop to be the best that I possibly can be as well. Yeah, we're peas in the pod, I think, in that respect, Aaron. So mm. uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. Absolutely, mate. Let's get into it. Um, now, I, I've, I've read a lot about you, Bushy, and I've been fortunate to pick up your books as well. And I think you, what you've put pen to paper with your books, um, I want to explore that. And we'll come to that in a little bit. You've been there, done that. So you need to build your own portfolio of your 12 investment properties, for example, for you to help, I think, what it's... Uh, $600 million worth of property help buy for clients. So again, we talk about the trained eye. You've seen probably to buy $600 million, you've probably looked at maybe three or four times that, if not more. Um, so you've certainly got a really good understanding and exposure to the Australian property market. Um, and you are regularly sought out from a media perspective. So in terms of, I guess, the knowledge that you've built up over time, that's what I'm trying to kind of pull out of your head over the next maybe 20, 30 minutes uh, and try and pass that on to our investor clients as well. But before we do kick off, I'd love if you could just share a little bit what I call the three P's, so a bit about yourself personally, a bit about yourself professionally, and then a bit about your own property journey as well, Bushy. Yeah, great, mate. Well, uh, as is obvious from my uh, nickname, which is basically my name, Bushy, I'm, <laughs> I'm a boy from the bush uh, who went to the big smoke and now, and now back in the bush. Yeah. Uh, and as I say, Aaron, you can take the uh, boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. Okay, full circle so, in life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very proudly a country boy. I'm, yeah. On the personal front, I'm also a bit of a closet muso, so you know, oh, don't let me loose on the piano or, or get me in a karaoke room because I don't need to drink to embarrass <laughs> myself there. I uh, love to play field hockey, mate. I've been uh, playing field hockey since I was 11, so if I get through this season, I'll have hit my 800th game. That's unreal. And I feel like hockey, also, just to touch on that point, I feel like hockey is one of those games where you can have a really long career in hockey. I feel like people, have, they start it, they've got a love for it, and they can continue to play 20, 30, 40 years onwards sometimes as well. It's a game that stands the test of time, right? Mate, there are eight-year-olds still playing hockey in melbourne which mm, believe it's unreal so uh there's, there's hope for me yet mate absolutely but, uh, mate. You've got plenty of you know plenty of legs left in you mate that's for sure yeah, yeah. I, well uh, fitness is uh you know you talked about sustainable success earlier mm. and you know my own belief is that it lies at the intersection of self health and wealth and well and self is what's between your ears health is you know what you do a day to day and the rewarding rituals and happy habits that you build up and that then feeds into uh, ultimately achieving wealth and however to decide to define it. But uh, mate, we also rescue Samoids. We, we love oh. our Samoid dogs. They, you know, you wake up to these uh, awesome smiles every morning. Uh, so uh, that's a, a little bit about where, where my interests lie, mm. apart from my uh, passion for property. Uh, born in a two-horse town in uh, country Victoria called Garoke. 
Wow. Uh, was pretty challenged early on. I uh, was born with a hair lip and had really chronic asthma as a youngster. Yeah. And because we moved around a fair bit, um, my father was a stock and station agent. So we moved from country town to country town. And because of the moves, I ended up being a lot younger and, and therefore a lot smaller yeah. than the rest of the class during those formative years. And I was unfortunately often referred to as the short ass, flat faced, punk chested <laughs> runt. So, um, <laughs> so I, my, Char- my character way building as a, as, a young, as a young kid. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I got the fair bit of rubbish because uh, mm. I was always the outs were always smaller and I had some physical challenges. So I I sort of learned to overcome that, mate, by just working harder and trying to be smarter to keep up with the rest of the crew. Yeah. And I remember early on, I uh, because I spent so much time in bed gasping for breath, I used to draw and create and design things. That was what I used to pass the time with. And uh, that was great. But my old man used to say, son, that's really good, but at some stage you've got to get out and get a real job. And I used to think, how am I going to combine my love of drawing and, and designing with, with something that's respected as a profession? And then the penny dropped. I had become an architect. Unreal. So uh, that's where my initial passion for property started, Aaron, and it's it's pretty much developed ever since. So, you know, I, I often say my professional life has been in two halves. There's BC an AD, and and what I mean by that is before the crisis and after the divorce. Uh, it's pretty right, much okay. how my professional life has actually unfolded. Yeah, because uh, you know I like like a lot of Aussies, uh, I was chasing the Aussie dream, which was mm. to work hard and and fortune were bound to follow, and that meant I could buy a beautiful home and pay it off and put money into super and then tick off my bucket list when I retired. Yeah. So, you know, in those early years to the outside world, I looked like I was living the dream. I was working on some fantastic projects across Australia and Asia. And, and I was uh, had, had a lot of fun, for example, uh, spent a couple of years uh, designing and re, reshaping the uh, Uluru Airs Rock Resort. Wow. So, you know, on the outside, I was mm. uh, looking like I was living the dream. But the reality, mate, was on the inside, I was dying on the vine because, you know, for 17 odd years, I was working seven days a week, 14 hours a day. And I was really got to be at stage where I was pretty much like a dead man walking. And I felt totally stuck on the treadmill. I was in this never ending cycle of work and struggle. And, and unfortunately I ended up burnt out, broken and broken at, at 33, pretty much lost everything. I lost my marriage. I lost my wealth wow. and my self wealth with it. So I really couldn't believe that I'd ended up there. And about the same time, it's funny how <clears throat> things happen in threes, but, About the same time, my father, who'd always been my role model, started having some major health issues. And, uh, you know, his attitude, like many Aussie guys, was, she'll be right, mate. exactly. And he totally ignored his health, pursuing wealth. Uh, And as a result, he he got cancer. He had multiple strokes. And he spent the last 10 years of his life dribbling out the side of his mouth, uh, totally paralysed down one side in a wheelchair with mum as his carer. And I'd never forget him saying, mate, in those dying days, he'd look me in the eye and he said, son, it's about time you stop following my example. It's about time you stop working for money and started getting your money to work for you. And that's that really, yeah, it really shook me up, mm-hmm. uh, Aaron. Uh, it was a, a, a pivotal moment for me. It pretty much became my mantra. And then as many Aussies have done, uh, around about the same time, uh, a mate of mine dragged me along to a Robert Kiyosaki conference in good old Adelaide. Unreal. You know, you know yeah. the old rich dad, poor dad fame. Yeah. And I'll never forget him saying from the stage that the moment that passive income becomes a part of your life, your life will change. Mm-hmm. And that absolutely, totally resonated with me. It was a real light bulb moment. I, I actually refer to it now as my Kiyosaki moment. And, and from that day on now, and I saw the world completely differently and I became what I now affectionately refer to as being passive aggressive. <laughs> and and uh, what I sort of jokingly mean by that is I became very aggressive about passive income. I so I, everything from that point on uh, had to do three key things. It had to create passive income. It had to grow in value and it had to be a saleable asset. Beautiful. And our, our thinking really shifted from, you know, the old salary to savings, from income to investment and from wealth. Mm. And I, I developed what I now refer to as two I seeing, and, and which is lo- almost like a parallel perspective because as an architect, you're used to uh, creating in your mind's eye uh, something beautiful that you want at the end of the journey. And then, then you progressively put a team around you and take the steps to make that happen. Yeah. So that became the essence of what we now refer to as living by design. 
And uh, my now life partner in all things, Sonia, and I uh, got together on a, a wintry Sunday afternoon in a little country uh, restaurant in Clarendon in South Australia. And we actually uh, designed our ideal lifestyle. We monetized it. And uh, I recorded on the phone. I've got vision boards, which I've still got around the house, uh, affirmations that went with it. <clears throat> and that become bo- became both the magnet and the compass that uh, has mm-hmm. enabled us to make decisions day to day on uh, whether it's taking us close to closer to that or further away. On track and, or off track, it's like it's how, how galvanized have you guys got by just writing it, by seeing it, by agreeing on it, for example. And I mean, we talk about you know, I love my wife Sonia. I've had the pleasure of having Sonia. And something magical happens when you're building the house of the same blueprints as opposed to how many couples are trying to build the same house of two different blueprints and it's their competing priorities, isn't it? Totally, mate. That's a very good point because, you know, that process that we started way back when in good old country Clarendon, we now do every year. Oh, so right. we take four four days out every year and we sit down and, and, and we really enjoy it. It's a really exciting uh, <laughs> process yeah and it reinvigorates us every year because we check in what's changed what's different uh, and enables a bit like a gps that enables us to yeah. retack and make sure that we're on track and that became the basis of of because we knew where we wanted to get to then the investing uh roadmap we then followed pretty much fell out of that so okay. no at that stage aaron i was on the bones of my backside putting it bluntly yeah, and we didn't really didn't have two cents to rub, rub together. It was a real ground zero for both of us. So what I first did, I yeah, actually because I had very little funds at all, I actually day traded the uh, share market for a couple of years to put enough money together to get our first deposit on a property. And then then Sonia and I started on what I now you know hindsight's an easy thing, Aaron, but mm. I refer to it as the the money Madison uh or the relationship relay that we then started because both <laughs> sonia and i wanted to have a fulfilling uh career yeah but we also wanted time out to spend uh doing things that are important to us so we what we did is and if you're familiar with the olympics uh, cyclists where the, the madison race where you've got two cyclists yeah uh competing one one's going hard around the track the other one's sort of resting on the top of the track yeah and then they switch over and they keep switching this until the end of the race well, uh, Sonia and I did this on a, what I call the worker and the wealth builder approach. So, you know, uh, we survived on for a period. Uh, Sonia worked while I, I day traded. Then uh, we decided that our first business was going to be a property management business because it was so dissatisfied with the level of property management we were getting from our own properties. Yep. So while, while Sonia started to build that business, I then did some consulting work for government to pay the bills. And then once the property management business was up and running, and uh, I, I, we both realised that property is very much a game of finance yeah. and that, you know, it's it's not about rate, it's about reach. So we uh, recognised that if we were really going to build the portfolio that we really needed to understand the uh, finance side of the equation. So we, we, I joined two partners early on in a finance business and uh, then ultimately we sold the property management business. Sonia and I came together and, and no know how was born as a lifestyle business about uh, about seven years ago now mate Unreal. so uh, so that's pretty much the, the the journey as far as that goes and I, i've got to be honest um you know we we started in investing very heavily uh, way back when and thanks heaven thank heavens we did and thank heavens i followed uh, dad's and robert kiyosaki's advice because about eight years ago i, I got that call that never want to get mm-hmm. our family doctor who'd been our doctor for nearly 30 years uh, rang me to tell me that mum had <clears> terminal <throat> cancer and only had about 12 months to live and uh understandably mum was absolutely devastated with that mate she's the, she was the most giving person we'd ever come across and she was more worried about the fact she wouldn't be able to help uh, us and others than she was about what it meant to her yeah, wow. and, and mum was always about TLC it was all always about tender loving care yeah and I realized at that point mate that uh, the best thing I could do to give back to mum given how much she'd given to me was to take that 12 months and spend that time with her and it was really the best and the worst year of my life uh, you know I'd, the reality is uh, you know mum and I had all the hard conversations mate we laughed we cried we reminisced I was there with her at all of her uh treatments and her dying wish was to die at home in her own bed so myself and my two brothers uh, made sure we made that happen to her 
And while it was the most difficult year, it was also surprisingly uh, the best year in terms of fulfilment because I, I finally realised what mum had always known, and that is that true fulfilment comes from giving freely to others without ever expecting anything in return. Mm. Uh, and I guess the gift I had following my good father's advice is that the only reason I could take that 12 months off is that we had the freedom of time yeah. because our investments were generating income that didn't rely on me to generate it. So, you know, at the end of the day for me, Aaron, it's all about time. And, uh, you know, sort of rolling forward to now, uh, Sonia and I enjoy a, an awesome lifestyle. Uh, we really wanting to give back to others. Uh, we're really wanting to wake up and shake up hardworking Aussies to the fact that the the traditional Aussie dream is broken. You know, yeah, if you correct. think you're going to just pay off your home, put money in super, and then retire comfortably, you're, you're kidding yourself. Yeah. And it's really important to get invested. So, you know, we, we're really keen now to, uh, together with you, uh, very similar message, to open hardworking Aussies to the opportunity that lies before them and the traps if they don't start getting invested. So that's, so that's, that's pretty much the, the journey as it stands, mate. Mate, there's so much uh, so much gold in there. I think the, one of the big ones is, yes, you talk about hardworking Aussies and we're, not, we're telling people it's like you're working hard but is your money working hard for you or are you, are you just caught on this bit of that treadmill, for example? I mean, numbers won't come as a surprise to you, but we talk about well, inflation at 5%. I don't think wage growth is going to match that. So effectively, you're going to go backwards in life because your wages aren't going to meet your cost of living. And so there's that deficit already in the household. Get a pay rise, people probably spend it before they actually get a chance to earn it. And it's like, right, these are all the trappings of this lifestyle. You need streams of revenue, for example, to then, if you see your life as a business, to go, right, if you're barely just breaking even, you wouldn't tell that's a good business plan to anyone that's self-employed. But how many households are breaking even and going, that's simply just not good enough, guys. Um, and they're tough conversations to have because it's highly emotionally charged because it's money and family, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely right, mate. And we get so we're so busy these days that we just don't uh, step out of the mm. exercise to take a little bit of time to really reflect on where we're heading. And that, that one of the first things we do with people that we try and help is we go, okay, well, let's just project forward on what you're currently doing yeah. and see where you're going to end up and and then ask them the question, are you happy with mm. with where you're going to sit? Because 90% of the people we, we talk to, Aaron, are likely to end up in a position where they're trying to retire on somewhere between 15 and 25 grand a year. Yeah, oh, spot on. Now, uh, spot on. It's a... Uh, it's a very scary concept, mate. But the, the interesting thing, is, as, as you would well know, is that the reverse of that is it's not that difficult if you've got enough time on your hands to completely change that position. Okay. And, and from our perspective, uh, property is the best vehicle in the country to allow you to make that happen. Yeah, spot on. So speaking of property, and you've had, I mean, you've mentioned and you've been very open and generous to share your own, I guess, your own portfolio. So thank you very much for being open. Uh, every in- every investor's journey is a bit like a roller coaster. There'll be some highs, there might be some lows, there'll be some challenges, for example, where things are just going great uh, and then it comes kind of crashing down. So when you reflect on your own journey yourself and Sonia, wins, setbacks, losses, learnings, for example, all of the above, can you kind of summarize the the portfolio in a, in a nutshell, mate, if you could? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd, I could probably honestly say that I've probably made every mistake you can possibly make. Yeah, uh, Aaron. Uh, and but the good good thing about that for me is that I treat uh, mistakes as as the biggest learning opportunities. Spot on. Spot on. And we've learned more from those issues than we have if it was plain Just sailing. Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, I'd give me a couple of examples. My uh, my very first entree into the property investment arena was back when I was an architect, and I was you know wet behind the the ears. Yeah. Uh, thought I was going to change the world uh, <laughs> and and bit off way more than I could chew. And uh, we ended up doing a one into four apartment development in Alice Springs, would you believe? Right, okay. Because uh, I, I was actually working as an architect in Alice Springs at yeah. the time and uh, I did everything wrong. So as an architect, it's all about winning awards and, and designing fantastic buildings. Mm. So we, we, we spent way too much on all of the wrong things in the wrong place 
Uh, then add the complication of the fact that it was me and three other partners in that. So, you know, that, wow. that's like marrying four people when you're trying to go into a, an investment exercise together. Yeah. Uh, really didn't spend much time getting clear on what our uh, mutual vision was. Uh, because we'd overcapitalized and the market changed significantly over the 12 months that we got into it, and what we thought we were going to get for the properties was nowhere near it. Uh, then each partners had different needs and desires. Mm. So that was a very ugly baptism of fire for me in the exercise. And, and I really licked my wounds from there. So when we seriously started to invest, when Sonia and I got together, uh, again, we probably made the, some of the biggest mistakes early on. And, and a lot of that was because I didn't trust anyone. Aaron, yeah, that's and that's uh, I wanted to reinvent the wheel. And in, in those situations, you just don't know what you don't know. Mm. So, you know, we, we were the classics, mate. We tried to find a property in our own backyard that we would like to live in, which yeah. is the, the worst possible recipe for investment that you can get. And uh, we ended up with a, a good property, and it's actually worked out well for us. If I, you know, we, we uh, uh, walked the streets, we found a property we liked. We uh, tracked down the owner who happened to be in Vietnam at the time. Wow. And uh, after a bit of toing and froing, managed to negotiate the purchase of the property. And we paid the princely sum of 84000 for that three bedroom <laughs> home in the south of Adelaide uh, back in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, properties, it, it, I mean, time is very forgiving in property. Mm. So that property is now worth uh, about a uh, bit over 700000 And uh, we've, we've still got it in the portfolio. But uh, some of the issues that we made early on, we had too many properties in close vicinity. Okay. So, uh, and as uh, this, this is the really important thing about investing in property. It's not about only investing in the properties, investing in your own knowledge. And that, mm. that evolves and grows over time. So the more knowledge you have, the better you get and the, and the better people you surround yourself with. So we shifted from being properties in our backyard, being borderless, uh, and started to spread uh, property around the country. And then overseas, we j jumped on a plane and went to the US uh, when the GFC hit because yep. we thought, you know, this is a once in a, a lifetime opportunity to pick up properties way cheaper than mm. they're ever going to be, which they were. Yeah. Uh, but that's been very challenging, I've got to say. Yeah. Uh, dealing with a different culture in a different country, in a different tax regime. Correct. Uh, and the, the major mistake we made there was that we assumed wrongly uh, that the professionalism of property people in the US will mm. be on par with Australia. And that's definitely not the case. We, uh, Australia is leaps and bounds ahead in terms of professionalism. So while the properties have done okay, it's been a real headache uh, yeah. trying to keep tabs on what's happening, manage them. Uh, we've turned the people over a number of times. It, it, that, that's been, I think, too challenging, to be honest. Yeah, uh, and you, you know, I've always said if you create a, a second job when you invest, you're probably not doing the right thing. And you know, the late night phone calls and whatnot associated with those properties have actually been a bit in fun and games. Mm. On the positive this is not side, the first though, time I've heard this about US property. By the way, I mean, I heard a few clients that have bought US properties, and the yields were phenomenal. For example, they bought you know well cheaper than they could buy in Australia, and go right, it's great. But the it came down to the administration of it and going right this. The admin side of it became far too time or energy consuming as well. So there is a, there's no passive investing either. You've got to be quite active when you're hands on and managing a portfolio across borders. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. But on the positive side, though, I think some of the learnings that we, that we have picked up along the way, and it's a little bit contrary to a lot of players in the property space. And, and perhaps it's because I'm an architect. I'm I'm very comfortable with building. Yeah, okay. Uh, because I spent so many time, so many years doing it. But uh, and I wouldn't be suggesting you do it in the current climate because the construction industry is out of control, and yeah, we've, okay. we've actively moved clients away from the the new build space mm. given the. Uh, difficulties of managing cost and time delivery Spot at on. the moment. Spot but in a normal scenario, uh, if you can locate a, a really good block in a tightly held area and you can build, purpose-built, a, uh, a property that uh, comes with all of the uh, tax benefits that go with it, uh, and you're effectively building it below market value, then they can be extremely good vehicles. 
So uh, they perform very well for us over time. Yeah. But again, I wouldn't be suggesting as a first time investor that you jump into that because your knowledge and expertise just isn't there. And there are a lot of risks that you're not even aware of when you start down that road. But as a first time investor, you don't have that margin of error sometimes as well because you're on maybe a limited budget. You need that first property to go well. So get confidence in the equity, then go again, for example. So when you, when the first one's a little bit risky, it's like, look, this could come off as a great risk, great reward. But if it doesn't, it's going to set you so far backwards that you're better off doing nothing sometimes than, than trying to go into a subdevelopment or a, or a knockdown rebuild as well, right? Yeah, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Beautiful. So uh, I 100% agree with you there. Yeah. Aaron, I, I guess one of the other things that was really beneficial to us uh, was that we became accidental rent investors. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it wasn't rent vesting wasn't even a thing <laughs> back in the nineties when we started this yeah. exercise. But uh, we bought this property well south of Adelaide, and we were a good hour and a half from there to work. So we we ended up uh, renting a, a a townhouse much closer to the city, mm. and then then uh, converting the property into a, a rental property at that point in time, and and then started to really understand all the benefits of that come yeah. from. Uh, you know, being able to write off all the costs associated with anything we did with that property during the time that it was in that position. So, yeah. you know, we've become big fans of rent vesting and I've helped a, a lot of other people who, uh, you know, initially don't have the mindset, but once once they see the numbers and what it can do for them, it can be a very powerful way to uh, really start getting yourself ahead in the, yeah, in the property arena. Spot on. Yeah, rent vesting isn't, isn't for everyone, right? So there's sometimes, you know, like families that are, want to put down roots, for example, and say, well, hang on, your mortgage, your rent could be equivalent to your, to your mortgage and you don't have other assets to your name, for example, but if, you're, if you understand the power of rent vesting and it's a time in your life where it suits you, it can be a really, really great way to, to get in. That property can grow in value um, and you don't have necessarily all the costs that come with maintain because maintaining and buying buying and maintaining a house can be quite quite intense as well. I can say that now that we're home, you know, we're, we're homeowners. I'm like, this needs to be done. This needs to be done. It's like it can become a little, I won't say a money pit because it's your lovely, beautiful family home, but it takes a lot as well to maintain a house where someone else is paying for those costs. It's, uh, it's a bit of a win-win. Totally, mate. Totally. So that, that's, that's probably the main things that, that came out of that, Aaron, mm. I think. Um, uh, there's others that I can go into, but, uh, mm. mindful of. Uh, nah, we could chat for hours. I'm, 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 I dare say we're going to get back in. But one thing I don't know when we've had a chat in the, in the past, um, something that really kind of resonated with me is when you see property one as a team sport, but also as an elite sport, right? So you need turn up and being technically. We'll use your analogy of hockey. Turn up and technically being good is one part, but if you're not doing the strength work, if you're not doing the diet work, if you're not doing the mindset work, if you don't have the right gear, for example, if you don't have the right team around you, being a great player is only one part of that, but there's there's no way to win. Uh, right? Totally. I, I, I often say to people now, when, when it comes to property, you're not a player. You are the owner of your team mm. and your only job is to manage your managers. There you go. Because... If, if you are creating that second job, you're not going to do it half as well as someone who, who does it all the time. Mm. It's going to take your eye off the ball and other things. And the time that you would otherwise be spending either uh, building your business or spending it with friends and family uh, tied up on, on doing a half-baked job on something that someone else can do far more effectively just doesn't make any sense to me. So, you know, it's, it's that, that old analogy. You know, if you, if you had to have life-changing brain surgery you wouldn't go to bunnings grab a scalpel and some metho and uh, have a crack at it yourself in front of the mirror and the ensuite at home <laughs> you'd get the best possible uh, neurosurgeon mm. and and all of the team around him to make sure that that operation was successful yet yet unfortunately that's exactly what a lot of investors do they don't see the value uh, you know they think look at cost rather than value i guess is mm. uh, the best analogy there aaron uh, and rather see rather than see the uh, advantages of engaging a independent professional to make that happen. They try and blunder through themselves as I did when I first started. And, and I, yeah. as a result, I'm making mistakes that I don't even know that they're making. Mm -hmm. No, well said, mate. Well said. Uh, I did mention at the start that you, you, know, you published two books and, I mean, your books have got great insights and been privileged to pick up uh, and, and have a read through them, mate. So, um, I'm, I'm no doubt, a labour of love to put pen to paper and trying to get those thoughts that also... You know, it's something that you become proud of as well. But 
Take me through a little bit about the ethos. So, I mean, your first book, The Freedom Formula, is fantastic, right? I love what it stands for. And I think it, I think that's almost a bit of a personal journey and reflection. If I look at your life and your journey, it's almost like this is my blueprint for my life. And people have resonated with that because they've been on the same, call it, treadmill of life. And then you look at your next book, uh, Get Invested, for example. And again, building a part of your story and, and your journey as well. Do you want to take us through a little bit about what's inspired then a little bit about what's inside the book as well? Yeah, well, I, I guess the reason I wrote the book was for the what we've already talked about. I wanted to wake up, wake up hard work and Aussies mm. the fact that if they don't get invested, then the future looks pretty bleak. Mm. I, but I also couldn't find a book at the time, Aaron, that, that really took people through the whole process. Yeah, okay. There were bits of it and there was a lot of generalisations. There was nothing that, that went from getting clear on your vision right through to delivering that and how property – uh, as a vehicle and that the, the importance of the finance piece of that fitted together mm. uh, to allow people to then pretty much follow the bouncing ball. So uh, I spent a lot of time and energy uh, really trying to boil it down into a format that people would in, both enjoy but get a lot out of yeah. and uh, take, them, take them through that process and, and look at the, the good, the bad and the ugly as far as that's concerned. So it's, it, it's, it's while property is at the centre of it, uh, because for me, it's it's all about helping people to achieve whatever their ideal lifestyle is. Yeah. Then, it, then it goes a fair bit uh, further than that. And uh, you know, as I keep saying, Aaron, it's it's not about the property or the money. It's all about time at the end of the day. So, property is the vehicle. Money is the fuel that ultimately gives you the time and the freedom to en- enjoy fulfilment in whatever that means to you. Mm. And uh, there's a couple of. Uh, key principles that I like to outline in the book. And, you know, I I talked uh, earlier about my good mother who, you know, I love her dearly and uh, she was all about TLC. Well, you know, there's three key things for sustainable success, which are almost laws of nature. And and if we boil it down and talk about them in TLC terms, it's time, leverage and compounding. Hmm. So time, what I've learned over the years that is that the property journey, if you're going to do well of it, is at least a 15-year journey. And if you you look back at property cycles over the last 30 years, uh, most areas uh, haven't gone through that cycle for 15 years to do that. So this is about embracing uh, property as a a long-term play. Uh, It's also about leveraging other people's expertise and leveraging other people's money. Smart. And you know, one of the big benefits of property is the fact that banks are still prepared to borrow 90 plus percent against the property and banks don't lose money, Aaron. Oh, great. Uh, then banks. that's telling you that it's yeah, a pretty safe will always be. parking. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And then of course, the C of the TLC is compounding. And you know, Albert Einstein referred to as compounding interest as the eighth wonder of the world. Mm. Those who understand and earn it and those who don't pay for it. Uh, those th- key th- things are pretty important to me. But it, also for me, it's not about the property. It's about the principles, the people, and the process that you need to adopt to make yeah. it happen. And the property is actually the last thing. The property pops mm. out that process, not the not the starting point. So, you know, I, I, I use this analogy, Alan, uh, Aaron, of uh, similar to preventative health. You know, most people are familiar with preventative health, and that's, yeah. you know, it's about taking regular supplements and vitamins that are going to uh, build and sustain your health uh, so that you don't get sick. Uh, I use the I use the, the term preventative wealth, which is about taking the the vitamin supplements, which are, end up being the eight core principles. So if we break vitamins, uh, each of those letters down, then that actually summarises what I consider to be the eight core principles of being successful in in property, and 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 really does uh, dictate. Uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about the freedom formula. So if we break those vitamins down very quickly, because ultimately it's about uh, getting fulfillment and freedom. You can only have fulfillment and freedom if you've got time on your hands. Mm. If you're going to get time on your hands, then you need to generate the passive income that's going to give you that time. So how do we do that? Well, let's break vitamins down. So the the, the first three letters in vitamins, which are the what I'd call the, the value, the interest rate of growth, and the time, are the things that, you know, most investors will get their head around. So the B for value is about uh, adopting what we call the bare facts. So, you know, how much can you borrow? What's your equity? Yeah. How affordable is a property? What are, And what is the risk uh, measure that you need to put around that? The I is for the interest rate of growth. 
And, you know, th- this is something that a lot of people don't spend enough time on. You know, a, a 3% difference in the growth rate over a 20-year period on a $400,000 property can be the a difference of $800,000 in equity or a 75% increase. Wow. So making sure you're focusing on areas that are going to uh, maximize that growth is really important. Uh, then we get to time. Now, as I've said, it's a long-term game, minimum 15 years. And the magic compounding comes behind that. But then we get into, uh, so they're the setup factors. The remaining five letters of vitamins are what I call the sustainability factors. And as you and I, you and I both know, Aaron, uh, you know, over 54% of first time investors sell a property within the, f- the first five years. Yeah. And I'm pretty convinced that it's because they haven't put time and energy into understanding these five sustainability Spire. factors. Spire. So if we and break those down. Feel, just, to, just to stop you there, I don't want to jump in, but. I almost feel like where the market, you know, the market's been so generous to investors and we're going to see a huge uptick of investors that jumped on during COVID. And as we come out of this cycle, I'd almost say that's going to be either shrunk down or we're going to see more investors maybe sell for not as much of the profit as they thought they would as well if they decide to sell. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's going to be really interesting, interesting Aaron, because mm. I, know I often talk about the property S-curve. And, you know, in most areas, and they're all operating uh, out of sync with each other, mm. but most of them will, will have growth of somewhere between two to five years, and then it'll plateau between five to eight years before it goes through its next growth spurt. Yeah. Well, what's going to happen now, and we've seen this happen in the past, people will jump in right at the top of the market just, be, just as it's flattening out and plateauing. Mm. The property values are unlikely to increase much for the next five to eight years, and, and many investors will get disgruntled with that, throw their arms up, up right. in the air, sell the properties just before they go through the next exactly, growth spurt. Yeah. So uh, I, that timing exercise is really important. But if we, we sort of shift into the sustainability, the, the A in vitamins is for affordability. And I, I, again, I don't see enough investors uh, look in detail at exactly how much is a property going to cost in year one, two, three, mm. five, 10, 15, before they've signed on the dotted line to make sure that they, they can actually last a distance. So, you know, I spend a lot of time with people really getting down to the nuts and bolts of exactly how much the property costs so that they can hang on to it while it is increasing in value and it's not going to be a big drag on their salary savings or limit their lifestyle. Yeah. So that affordability piece is a really important consideration. And then the M in the vitamins is for mindset. So this is about your beliefs, your attitudes and your expectations. And I jokingly say that there are six P's in mindset. And they are purpose, perspective, plan, be proactive. It's about the probability and risk. It's, and it's about patience and persistence. So you need to be clear on your purpose. And this needs to be supported by a perspective of exactly how you want to live your life. You then need to create a plan of how you're going to get from here to there. And you need to be, need to be proactive by implementing the action to make it happen that sits comfortably with your probability or your sleep at night factor. Yeah. And then you need to monitor the performance of your investment and last and importantly, you have the patience and the persistence to stay the course and see it through. So that's the that's the uh, that's what's between our ears, and it's often what's between our ears that makes or breaks our investment journey, not the property. The next thing is is the eye for income, and uh, a lot of I hear I still hear a lot of people talking about oh, I become a full time property investor. Uh, give away your job and jump straight into it. But mm. you and I both know that if you're not earning a consistent and, su- and sustainable income, then no bank's going to lend you the money Correct. to do anything. Correct. So you've you got know, a great lifestyle, having, but you just don't have the ability to grow your portfolio. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. So, so having that uh, ongoing consistent stream of income, uh, particularly in the early days, is really important. Mm. Uh, the N in vitamins is for network. You know, you, you probably heard that saying that your network equals your net worth. Yes. Well, that that is about the elite, elite team that you need to surround yourself. And the final one in vitamins is the strategy. And it's the most important one, mate. Uh, I don't see enough investors uh, injecting time into not just the property strategy, but get your life strategy right first, then your finance strategy so you know what your capacity is and 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 maximising your opportunity. And then finally, the property strategy folds out of that. So, you, uh, so they're, the, they're the key components, the, the key principles. Uh, it is about becoming passively aggressive, as I, as I like to say. And I, I implore anyone who's uh, listening and watching to your awesome podcast, Aaron, to get invested and to yeah. start doing it sooner rather than later. Mate, say advice um, from someone who's 
walk the path of an investor, had the roller coaster, and still is a huge advocate for it for no other reason but to go have a good life and then you can then have the freedom to make decisions about how you want to spend your life and and, and building quality relationships with your family, right? And that's ultimately what it comes down to. It's building a better life for yourself and your family. Um, property is simply that vehicle to get there. And some people maybe shares, some people maybe crypto. There's no, there's no right or wrong. It's just whatever your poison is, double down on that and focus on it and, and get it to serve you rather than the other way around. Totally, totally. I mean, there's no rocket science in any of this, Aaron, and, mm. and we haven't invented it, but there's very few people that do it. That's right. And, uh, you know, I, I find it quite sad, actually, mm. that uh, people kid themselves that oh, it's okay, I've got plenty of time. Well, time is a key ingredient because you've got to use your time you've got now so that you've got the time ahead of you to work for you so you actually get your time back at the end. Mm. And uh, for those who keep putting it off and other things get in the road, uh, what becomes an easy walk becomes a very steep, steep climb. Aaron, hmm. and uh, the, the steeper that climb and the less time you've got, the more risk you've got to take to try and make that happen. That's exactly and, uh, it. You and I have probably seen plenty of people in their mid-50s who come to me and say, oh, they have what I call their oh, oh shit super moment. Yeah. And they go, oh shit, my super's not going to be enough to sustain my lifestyle. I'm either going to have to keep working until I drop or survive on the smell of an oily rag. And yeah. they come to me and say, Bushy, help me out. I need to invest in property. I want to retire in five years. And I say, well, you're kidding yourself. It ain't going to happen. Yeah. Uh, you're going to be having to put, put the nose down and invest uh, aggressively for the next 15 years to put yourself in that position. And that's the challenge, aggressively, but you've got more to lose at that stage. Whereas you know, someone younger doesn't have the borrowing capacity, but they've got the risk appetite or the aggressiveness on their side, but they don't have the ability. Whereas you go later in life, it's like, now you've got the means, you've got good income, you've got good equity, for example, you've got good borrowing capacity, but you're less risk adverse because if it goes, you know, if you have the market conditions, if anything goes wrong, it's like the stakes are a lot higher as well. So that's a, yeah, the, yeah, I see it. Totally. I see the challenge of the young, the younger investors just want to go gun ho, and then you know later in life it's like, oh, I worked too hard to risk this, for example, and um, you see that that battle that goes on. Yeah. Totally agree. And I, I, I guess one of the one of the things I'd also like to reinforce is don't be scared of mistakes, because uh, mm, we'll I, I see a lot of investors who will make a mistake and that, that's it. They wash their hands, walk away, and they Correct. they miss the opportunity use them as a, a real learning opportunity because that's where the, the, the biggest learnings will come from and uh, stick to it yeah. because uh, you know there's a lot of people over a long period of time that are well out of property and will continue to do so yeah. you, know, I, you know people keep saying to me well is is it too late now for property well as long as people are living in houses there's opportunity in property spot on, you know? spot on. Uh, and and those opportunities will change and the way that you approach it will change over time but those fundamentals, the TLC fundamentals are always going to be there. It's mm. all about the long term. It's all about leveraging. And it's all about the magic of compounding. Oh, well said, mate. Well said. Bushy, loved our chat. And there's so much uh, there's so much wisdom there. Um, if you want to connect with Bushy and his team at Know How, we'll include a link to their socials, to their website, and most importantly, the link to Bushy's books as well. So if you want to um, carve out some time on a weekend for self-development, putting yourself first and your knowledge first, which you know, Bushy had that aha moment when he was seeing Rob Kiyosaki. I'm going to joke that he had Rich Dad, but he also had Richer Dad is your story as well. There might be a third book in you uh, with that title right there. Uh, you can give me royalties later as well. But um, Bushy, I want to say thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you for your energy, but thanks very much just for being so willing to share your knowledge and your insights with us, mate. I really, really appreciate it. No, thank you, Aaron. That's I've been very humbled to join you, and I'm no, actually no. looking forward to returning the suit by getting you on uh, the Get Invested podcast there and the Realty <laughs> Talk Show, mate, so that uh, you can spread uh, your words of wisdom to a ready audience. Ah, oh, man, wonderful, wonderful, mate. Looking forward to it, and uh, to all our listeners out there, I just want to say thank you very much for your time. Uh, we hope you found that helpful and useful as well. So, if you do love it, drop us a comment or give us a review. We we'll look forward to your feedback and making this a bigger and better podcast for your ears. And until next time, take care. That's another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. Thanks.